Boundaries when to say yes when to say no to take control of your life. Dr. Henry Cloud Dr. John Townsend To Henry and Louise Cloud And John and Rebecca Townsend, whose training in boundaries made a difference in our lives. Acknowledgements Scott Bolander and Bruce Ricecamp caught the vision for this book from the very beginning. They arranged for a retreat on Lake Michigan, where we passed this vision on to other Zone Durban staff members. Sandy Vanderzik directed the editorial process and fine-tuned the manuscript into a book that is more graceful, more precise, and easier to read and understand. Dan Runyon cut the book down to a manageable size. Dave Anderson translated this book into a video curriculum. Celie Yates encouraged and supported us throughout the whole process, from contract to finished book. Part 1. What are boundaries? 1. A day in a boundaryless life. 6 a.m. the alarm jangled. Bleary-eyed from too little sleep, Sherry shut off the noisy intruder, turned on the bedside lamp, and sat up in bed. Looking blankly at the wall, she tried to get her bearings. Why am I dreading this day? Lord, didn't you promise me a life of joy? Then, as the cobwebs left her mind, Sherry remembered the reason for her dread, the four o'clock meeting with Todd's third grade teacher. The phone call returned to her memory, Sherry, this is Jean Russell. I wonder if we could meet about Todd's performance and his behavior. Todd couldn't keep still and listen to his teachers. He didn't even listen to Sherry and Walt. Todd was such a strong-willed child and she didn't want to quench his spirit. Wasn't that more important? Well, no time to worry about all that, Sherry said to herself, raising her 35-year-old body off the bed and patting to the shower. I've got enough troubles to keep me busy all day. Under the shower, Sherry's mind moved out of first gear. She began mentally ticking off the day's schedule. Todd, 9, and Amy, 6, would have been a handful even if she weren't a working mother. Let's see. Fix breakfast, pack two lunches, and finish sewing Amy's costume for the school play. That will be a 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12 36 p.m. page 11. Trick, finishing sewing the costume before the carpool picks her up at 7.45 a.m. Sherry thought regretfully about last night. She'd planned to work on Amy's costume then, using her talents to make a social day for her little girl. But her mother had dropped over. Unexpectedly. Good manners dictated that she play hostess, and another evening was shot. The memories of her attempts to salvage the time wasn't pretty. Trying to be diplomatic, Sherry artfully told her mother, you can't imagine how much I enjoy your surprise visits, mom. But I was wondering, would you mind if I sew Amy's costume while we talk? Sherry cringed inwardly, correctly anticipating her mother's response. Sherry, you know I'd be the last to intrude on your time with your family. Sherry's mother, widowed for twelve years, had elevated her widowhood to the status of martyrdom. I mean, since your father died, it's been such an empty time. I still miss our family. How could I deprive you of that for yourself? I'll bet I find out how Sherry thought to herself. That's why I can understand why you don't bring Walt and the children to see me much anymore. How could I enter training? I'm just a lonely old lady who gave her entire life to her. Children. Who would want to spend any time with me? No, Mom, no, no, no. Sherry quickly joined the emotional minuet she and her mom had been dancing for decades. That's not what I meant at all. I mean, it's so special having you over. Goodness knows, with our schedule, we'd like to visit more, but we just haven't been able to. That's why I'm so glad you took the initiative. Lord, don't strike me dead for this little lie, she prayed silently. I can do the costume any old time, Sherry said. Forgive me for this lie, too. Now, why don't I make us some coffee? Her mother sighed. All right, if you insist but I just hate to think I'm intruding. The visit lasted well into the night. By the time her mother left, Sherry felt crazy, but she justified it to herself. At least I've helped make her lonely day a little brighter. Then a pesky voice piped up. 
If you helped so much, why was she still talking about her loneliness when she left? Trying to ignore the thought, Sherry went to bed. 6.45 a.m. Sherry returned to the present. No use crying over spilled time. I guess, she mumbled to herself as she struggled to close the zip of her black linen skirt. Her favorite suit had become, as many. Others had, too tight. Middle age spread so soon? She thought. This week, I have to go on a diet and start exercising. The next hour was, as usual, a disaster. The kids whined about getting out of bed, and Walt complained, can't you get the kids to the table on time? 7.45 a.m. Miraculously, the kids made it to their rides, Walt left for work in his car, and Sherry went out and locked the front door after her. Taking a deep breath, she prayed silently, Lord, I'm not looking forward to this day. Give me something to hope for. In her car on the freeway, she finished applying her makeup. Thank the Lord for the traffic jams. 8.45 a.m. Rushing into McAllister Enterprises where she worked as a fashion consultant, Sherry glanced at her watch. Only a few minutes late. Maybe by now her colleagues understood that being late was a way of life for her and did not expect her to be on time. She was wrong. They'd started the weekly executive meeting in without her. Sherry tried to tiptoe in without being noticed. But every eye was on her as she struggled into her seat. Glanking around, she gave a fleeting smile and muttered something. About that crazy traffic. A day in a boundaryless life. 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12 36 p.m. Page 13. 14 11 59 a.m. The rest of Sherry's morning proceeded fairly well. A tall entered fashion designer, Sherry had an unerring eye for attracting type clothing and was a valuable asset to McAllister. The only hitch came just before lunch. Her extension rang. Sherry Phillips. Sherry, thank goodness you're there. I don't know what I'd have done if you'd been at lunch. There was no mistaking this voice. Sherry had known Lois Thompson since grade school. A high-strung woman, Lois was always in crisis. Sherry had always tried to make herself available to Lois, to be there for her. But Lois never asked Sherry how she was doing, and when Sherry mentioned her struggles, Lois either changed the subject or had to leave. Sherry genuinely loved Lois and was concerned about her problems, but Lois seemed more like a client than a friend. Sherry resented the imbalance in their friendship. As always, Sherry felt guilty when she thought about her anger at Lois. As a Christian, she knew the value the Bible placed on loving and helping others. There I go again, she would say to herself. Thinking of myself before others. Please, Lord, let me give to Lois freely and not be so self-centered. Sherry asked, What's the matter, Lois? It's horrible, just horrible, Lois said. Anne was sent home from school today, Tom was denied his promotion and my car gave out on the freeway. This is what my life's like every day. Sherry thought to herself, feeling the resentment rising. However, she merely said, Lois, you poor thing. How are you coping with all of this? Lois was happy to answer Sherry's question in great detail. So much detail that Sherry missed half her lunch break console in her friend. Well, she thought, fast food's better than no food. Sitting at the drive through waiting for her chicken burger, Sherry thought about Lois. If all my listening, consoling, and advice had made any difference over the years, maybe it would. Be worth it but Lois makes the same mistakes now that she made 20 years ago. Why do I do this to myself? 4 p.m. Sherry's afternoon passed uneventfully. She was on the way out of the office to the teacher's meeting when her boss, Jeff Moreland flagged her down. Glad I caught up with you, Sherry, he said. A successful figure at McAllister Enterprises, Jeff made things happen. Trouble was, Jeff often used other people to make things happen pen. Sherry could sense the hundredth verse of the same old song tuning up again. Listen, I'm in a time crunch, he said, handing her a large sheaf of papers. This is the data for the final recommendations for the Kimbrough account. All it needs is a little writing and editing. And it's due tomorrow. But I'm sure it'll be no problem for you. He smiled ingratiatingly. 
Sherry panicked. Jeff's editing needs were legendary. Hefting the papers in her hands, Sherry saw a minimum of five hours work. I had this data into him three weeks ago. She thought furiously. Where does this man get off having me save his face for his deadline? Quickly she composed herself. Sure, Jeff. It's no problem at all. Glad I can help. What time do you need it? Nine o'clock would be fine. And. Thanks, Sherry. I always think of you first when I'm in a jam. You're so dependable. Jeff strolled away. Dependable. Faithful. Reliable, Sherry thought. I've always been described this way by people who wanted something from me. Sounds like a description of a good mule. Suddenly the guilt hit again. There I am, getting resentful again. Lord, help me. Bloom where I'm planted. But secretly she found herself wishing she could be transplanted to another flower pot. 4.30 p.m. Jean Russell was a competent teacher, one of many in the profession who understood the complex factors beneath a child's. A day in a boundaryless life. 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12.36 p.m. Page 15. 16. Problem Behavior. The meeting with Todd's teacher began as so many before, minus Walt. Todd's father hadn't been able to get off work, so the two women talked alone. He's not a bad child, Sherry, Mrs. Russell reassured her. Todd is a bright, energetic boy. When he minds, he's one of the most enjoyable kids in the class. Sherry waited for the axe to fall. Just get to the point, Jean. I have a problem child, don't I? What's new? I have a problem life to go with it. Sensing Sherry's discomfort, the teacher pressed ahead. The problem is that Todd doesn't respond well to limits. For example, during our task period, when children work on assignments, Todd has great difficulty. He gets up from his desk, pesters other kids, and won't stop talking. When I mention to him that his behavior is inappropriate, he becomes enraged and obstinate. Sherry felt defensive about her only son. Maybe Todd has an attention deficit problem, or he's hyperactive? Mrs. Russell shook her head. When Todd's second grade the teacher wondered about that last year, psychological testing ruled that out. Todd stays on task very well when he's interested in the subject. I'm no therapist, but it seems to me that he's just not used to responding to rules. Now Sherry's defensiveness turned from Todd to herself. Are you saying this is some sort of home problem? Mrs. Russell looked uncomfortable. As I said, I'm not a counselor. I just know that in third grade, most children resist. Rules. But Todd is off the scale. Anytime I tell him to do some the thing he doesn't want to it's World War III. And since all his intellectual and cognitive testing comes out normal, I was just wondering how things were at home. Sherry no longer tried to hold back the tears. She buried her head in her hands and wept convulsively for a few minutes, feeling overwhelmed with everything. Eventually, her crying subsided. I'm sorry. I guess this just hit on a bad day. Sherry rummaged in her purse for a tissue. No, no, it's more than that. Jean, I need to be honest with you. Your problems with him are the same as mine. Walt and I have a real struggle making Todd's mind at home. When we're playing or talking, Todd is the most wonderful son I could imagine. But any time I have to discipline him, the tantrums are more than I can handle. So I guess I don't have any solutions for you. Jean nodded her head slowly. It helps me, Sherry, to know that Todd's behavior is a problem at home, too. At least now we can put our heads together on a solution. 5.15 p.m. Sherry felt strangely grateful for the afternoon rush hour traffic. At least there's no one tugging on me here, she thought. She used the time to plan around her next crises, kids, dinner, Jeff's project, church. And Walt. 6.30 p.m. for the fourth and last time, dinner's ready. Sherry hated to scream, but what else worked? The kids and Walt always seemed to shuffle in whenever they felt like it. More often than not, dinner was cold by the time everyone was assembled. Sherry had no clue what the problem was. She knew it wasn't the food, because she was a good cook. Besides, 
once they got to the table, everyone inhaled it in seconds. Everyone but Amy? Watching her daughter sit silently, picking distractedly at her food, Sherry again felt uneasy. Amy was. Such a lovable, sensitive child. Why was she so reserved? Amy. Had never been outgoing. She preferred to spend her time reading Ing, painting, or just sitting in her bedroom thinking about. Stuff. Honey, what kind of stuff? Sherry would probe. Just stuff, would be the usual reply. Sherry felt shut out of. Her daughter's life. She dreamed of mother-daughter talks, conversions for just us girls, shopping trips. But Amy had a secret place deep inside where no one was ever invited. This unreachable part of her daughter's heart Sherry ached to touch. A day in a boundaryless life. 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12 36 p.m. page 17. 18 7 p.m. halfway through dinner, the phone rang. We need to get an answering machine to handle calls during dinner, Sherry thought. There's precious little time for us to be together as a family anymore. Then, as if on cue, another familiar thought struck her. It might be someone who needs me. As always, Sherry listened to the second voice in her head and jumped up from the table to answer the phone. Her heart sank as she recognized the voice on the other end. Hope I'm not disturbing anything, said Phyllis Renfro, the women's ministries leader at church. Certainly you aren't disturbing anything, Sherry lied again. Sherry, I'm in deep water, Phyllis said. Margie was going to be our activities coordinator at the retreat, and now she can sell something about priorities at home, any way you can. Pitch in? The retreat. Sherry had almost forgotten that the annual gathering of church women was this weekend. She had been looking forward to leaving the kids and Walt behind and strolling around the beautiful mountainous area for two days, just herself and the Lord. The possibility of solitude felt better to her than the planned group activities. Taking on Margie's activities coordinator position would mean giving up her precious alone time. No, it wouldn't work. Sherry would just have to say. Automatically, the second thought pattern intervened. What a privilege to serve God and these women, Sherry. By giving up a little portion of your life, by letting go of your selfishness, you can make a big difference in some lives. Think it over. Sherry didn't have to think it over. She'd learned to respond unquestioningly to this familiar voice, just as she responded to her mother's, Phyllis's, and maybe God's, too. Whoever it belonged to, it was too strong to be ignored. Habit one out. I'll be happy to help, Sherry told Phyllis. Just send me whatever Margie's done, and I'll get working on it. Phyllis sighed, audibly relieved. Sherry, I know it's a sacrifice. Myself, I have to do it several times, every day. But that's the abundant Christian life, isn't it? Being living sacrifices. If you say so, thought Sherry. But she couldn't help one during when the abundant part would come in. 7.45 p.m. Dinner finally finished, Sherry watched Walt position himself in front of the TV for the football game. Todd reached for the phone, asking if his friends could come over and play. Amy slipped unobserved to her room. The dishes stayed on the table. The family hadn't quite got ten the hang of helping clean up yet. But maybe the kids were still a little young for that. Sherry started clearing the dishes from the table. 11.30 p.m. Years ago, Sherry could have cleaned up after dinner, got ten the kids to bed on time, and performed Jeff's handed off. Project with ease. A cup of coffee after dinner and the adrenal line rush that accompanied crises and deadlines galvanized. Sherry into superhuman feats of productivity. She wasn't called Super Sherry for nothing. But it was becoming noticeably harder these days. Stress. Didn't work like it used to. More and more, she was having True Blay concentrating, forgetting dates and deadlines, and not even caring a great deal about it all. At any rate, by sheer willpower, she had completed most of her tasks. Maybe Jeff's project had suffered a little in quality, 
but she felt too resentful to feel bad. But I did say yes to Jeff, Sherry thought. It's not his fault, it's mine. Why couldn't I tell him how unfair it was for him to lay this on me? No time for that now. She had to get on with her real task for the evening, her talk with Walt. She and Walt's courtship and early marriage had been pleasant. Where she'd been confused, Walt had been decisive. Where? A day in a boundaryless life. 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 1237 PM Page 19. 20. She'd felt insecure, he'd been strong. Not that Sherry wasn't contributing to the marriage. She saw Walt's lack of emotional con-connectedness, and she had taken upon herself the job of providing. The warmth and love the relationship lacked. God has put together a good team, she would tell herself. Walt has the leadership, and I have the love. This would help her get over the lonely times when he couldn't seem to understand her to hurt feelings. But over the years, Sherry noted a shift in the relationship. It started subtly, then became more pronounced. She could hear it in his sarcastic tone when she had a complaint. She saw it in the lack of respect in his eyes when she tried to tell him about her need for more support from him. She felt it in his increasingly insistent demands for her to do things his way. And his temper. Maybe it was job stress, or having kids. Whatever it was, Sherry never dreamed she'd ever hear the cut ting, angry words she heard from the lips of the man she'd mar read. She didn't have to cross him much at all to be subjected to. The anger, burnt toast, a checking overdraft, or forgetting to gas up the car, any of these seemed to be enough. It all pointed to one conclusion, the marriage was no longer. A team, if it ever had been one. It was a parent-child relationship the ship, with Sherry on the wrong end. At first, she thought she was imagining things. There I go. Again, looking for trouble when I have a great life, she told herself. That would help for a while, until Walt's next temper. Attack! Then her hurt and sadness would tell her the truth her mind wasn't willing to accept. Finally realizing that Walt was a controlling person, Sherry. Took the blame upon herself. I'd be that way, too, if I had boss cat case like me to live with, she'd think. I'm the reason he gets. So critical and frustrated. These conclusions led Sherry to a solution she had practiced for years, loving Walt out of his anger. This remedy went. Something like this, first, Sherry learned to read Walt's emotions by watching his temper, body language, and speech. She became exquisitely aware of his moods, and especially sensitive to things that could set him off, lateness, disagreements, and her anger. As long as she was quiet and agreeable, things went well. But let her preferences raise their ugly heads and she risked getting her head lopped off. Sherry learned to read Walt well, and quickly. After sensing that she was crossing an emotional line, she would employ stage. Two of loving Walt, she did an immediate backtrack. Calming around to his viewpoint, but not really, quietly holding her. Tongue, or even outrightly apologizing for being hard to live with all helped. Stage 3 of loving Walt was doing special things for him to show that she was sincere. This might mean dressing more attractively at home. Or making his favorite meal several times a week. Didn't the Bible talk about being this kind of wife? The three steps of loving Walt worked for a time. But the peace never lasted. The problem with loving Walt out of his anger was that Sherry was dead tired of trying to soothe Walt out of his tantrums. Thus, he stayed angry longer, and his anger isolated her more from him. Her love for her husband was eroding. She had felt that no matter how bad things were, God had joined them and that their love would get them through. But, in the past few years, it was more commitment than love. When she was honest, she admit Ted that many times she could feel nothing at all toward Walt. But resentment and fear. And that's what tonight was all about. Things needed to change. Somehow, they needed to rekindle the flames of their first love. Sherry walked into the family room. The late night come Diane on the television screen had just finished his monologue. Honey, can we talk? She asked tentatively. There was no answer. Moving closer, 
she saw why. Walt had fallen asleep on the couch. Thinking about waking Walt up, she remembered his stinging words the last time she'd been so insensitive. She turned off the television and lights and walked to the empty bedroom. A day in a boundaryless life. 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 1237 p.m. Page 21. 22 11 50 p.m. Lying in bed, Sherry couldn't tell which was greater, her lone lines or her exhaustion. Deciding it was the first, she picked up her Bible from the bedside table and opened it to the New Testament. Give me something to hope for, Lord. Please, she prayed. Silently. Her eyes fell on the words of Christ in Matthew 5 3-5, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. But Lord, I already feel like that. Sherry protested. I feel poor in spirit. I mourn over my life, my marriage, and my children. I try to be gentle, but I just feel run over all the time. Where is your promise? Where is your hope? Where are you? Sherry waited in the darkened room for an answer. None came. The only sound was the quiet pit pat of tears running off her cheeks and onto the pages of her Bible. What's the problem? Sherry tries to live her life the right way. She tries to do a good job with her marriage, her children, her job, her relationship ships, and her Lord. Yet it's obvious that something isn't right. Life isn't working. Sherry's in deep spiritual and emotional pain. Woman or man, we can all identify with Sherry's dilemma, her isolation, her helplessness, her confusion, and her guilt. And, above all, her sense that her life is out of control. Look closely at Sherry's circumstances. Parts of Sherry's life may be remarkably similar to your own. Understanding her struggle may shed light on yours. You can immediately see a few answers that don't work for Sherry. First, trying harder isn't working. Sherry expends lots of energy trying to have a successful life. She isn't lazy. Second, being nice out of fear isn't working. Sherry's people-pleasing efforts don't seem to bring her the intimacy she needs. Third, taking responsibility for others isn't working. A master of taking care of the feelings and problems of others, Sherry feels like her life is a miserable failure. Sherry's unproductive energy, fearful, niceness, and over-responsibility point to the core problem, Sherry suffers from severe difficulties in taking ownership of her life. Back in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve about ownership, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground, General 1 Made in the image of God, we were created to take responsibility for certain tasks. Part of taking responsibility, or ownership, is knowing what is our job, and what isn't. Workers who, Continually take on duties that aren't theirs will eventually burn out. It takes wisdom to know what we should be doing and what we shouldn't. We can't do everything. Sherry has great difficulty in knowing what things are her responsibility and what aren't. In her desire to do the right thing, or to avoid conflict, she ends up taking on problems that God never intended her to take on. Her mother's chronic loneliness, her boss's irresponsibility, her friend's unending crises her church leader's guilt-ridden message of self-sacrifice, and her husband's immaturity. And her problems don't end there. Sherry's inability to say no has significantly affected her son's ability to delay gratificate tie-in and behave himself in school, and, in some way, this inability may be driving her daughter to withdraw. Any confusion of responsibility and ownership in our lives is a problem of boundaries, just as homeowners set physical property lines around their land, we need to set mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual boundaries for our lives to help us distinguish what is our responsibility and what isn't. As we see in Sherry's many struggles, the inability to set appropriate boundaries at appropriate times with the appropriate people can be very destructive. And this is one of the most serious problems facing Christians today. Many sincere, 
dedicated believers struggle with. A day in a boundaryless life. 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 1237 p.m. page 23. 24. Tremendous confusion about when it is biblically appropriate to set limits. When confronted with their lack of boundaries, they raise good questions. 1. Can I set limits and still be a loving person? 2. What are legitimate boundaries? 3. What if someone is upset or hurt by my boundaries? 4. How do I answer someone who wants my time, love, energy, or money? 5. Why do I feel guilty or afraid when I consider setting boundaries? 6. How do boundaries relate to submission? 7. Aren't boundaries selfish? Misinformation about the Bible's answers to these issues has led to much wrong teaching about boundaries. Not only that, but many clinical psychological symptoms, such as depression, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, addictions, impulsive disorders, guilt problems, shame issues, panic disorders, and marital and relational struggles, find their root in conflicts with boundaries. This book presents a biblical view of boundaries, what they are, what they protect, how they are developed, how they are injured, how to repair them, and how to use them. This book will answer the above questions and more. Our goal is to help. You use biblical boundaries appropriately to achieve the relationships and purposes that God intends for you as His child. Sherry's knowledge of the Scripture seems to support her lack of boundaries. This book aims to help you see the deeply biblical nature of boundaries as they operate in the character of God, His universe, and His people. 2. What does a boundary look like? The parents of a 25-year-old man came to see me with a common request, they wanted me to fix their son, Bill. When I asked where Bill was, they answered, oh, he didn't want to come. Why? I asked. Well, he doesn't think he has a problem, they replied. Maybe he's right, I said, to their surprise. Tell me about it. They recited a history of problems that had begun at a very young age. Bill had never been quite up to snuff in their eyes. In recent years he had exhibited problems with drugs and an inability to stay in school and find a career. It was apparent that they loved their son very much and were heartbroken over the way he was living. They had tried everything they knew to get him to change and live a responsive lay life, but all had failed. He was still using drugs, avoiding responsibility, and keeping questionable company. They told me that they had always given him everything he needed. He had plenty of money at school so he wouldn't have to work and he would have plenty of time for study and a social life. When he flunked out of one school, or stopped going to classes, they were more than happy to do everything they could to get him into another school, where it might be better for him. After they had talked for a while, I responded, I think your son is right. He doesn't have a problem. You could have mistaken their expression for a snapshot, they stared at me in disbelief for a full minute. Finally the 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12.37 p.m. page 25. 26. Father said, Did I hear you right? You don't think he has a problem? That's correct, I said. He doesn't have a problem. You do. He can do pretty much whatever he wants, no problem. You pay, you fret, you worry, you plan, you exert energy to keep him going. He doesn't have a problem because you have taken it from him. Those things should be his problem, but as it now stands, they are yours. Would you like for me to help you help him to have some problems? They looked at me like I was crazy, but some lights were beginning to go on in their heads. What do you mean, help him to have some problems? His mother asked. Well, I explained, I think that the solution to this problem would be to clarify some boundaries so that his actions cause him problems and not you. What do you mean, boundaries? The father asked. Look at it this way. It is as if he's your neighbor, who never waters his lawn. But, whenever you turn on your sprinkler system, the water falls on his lawn. Your grass is turning brown and dying, but Bill looks down at his green grass and thinks to himself, my yard is doing fine. That is how your son's life is. He doesn't study, or plan, or work, 
yet he has a nice place to live, plenty of money, and all the rights of a family member who is doing his part. If you would define the property lines a little better, if you would fix the sprinkler system so that the water would fall on your lawn, and if he didn't water his own lawn, he would have to live in dirt. He might not like that after a while. As it stands now, he is irresponsible and happy, and you are responsible and miserable. A little boundary clarification would do the trick. You need some fences to keep his problems out of your yard and in his, where they belong. Isn't that a bit cruel, just to stop helping like that? The father asked. Has helping him helped? I asked. His look told me that he was beginning to understand. Invisible property lines and responsibility in the physical world, boundaries are easy to see. Fences, signs, walls, moats with alligators, manicured lawns, or hedges are all physical boundaries. In their differing appearances, they give the same message this is where my property begins. The owner of the property is legally responsible for what happens on his or her property. Non-owners are not responsible for the property. Physical boundaries mark a visible property line that someone holds the deed to. You can go to the county courthouse and find out exactly where those boundaries of responsibility are and whom to call if you have business there. In the spiritual world, boundaries are just as real, but often harder to see. The goal of this chapter is to help you define your intangible boundaries and to recognize them as an ever-present reality that can increase your love and save your life. In reality, these boundaries define your soul, and they help you to guard it and maintain it, Prov. 423. Me and not me boundaries define us. They define what is me and what is not me. A boundary shows me where I end and someone else begins, leading me to a sense of ownership. Knowing what I am to own and take responsibility for gives me freedom. If I know where my yard begins and ends, I am free to do with it what I like. Taking responsibility for my life opens up many different options. However, if I do not own my life, my choices and options become very limited. Think how confusing it would be if someone told you to guard this property diligently, because I will hold you responsible for what happens here, and then did not tell you the boundaries of the property, or they did not give you the means with which to protect the property. This would be not only confusing but also potentially dangerous. This is exactly what happens to us emotionally and spiritual ally, however. God designed a world where we all live within. What does a boundary look like? Oh, one dot boundaries May 14, 2001 12.37 p.m. page 27. 28. Ourselves, that is, we inhabit our own souls, and we are responsible for the things that make up us. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no one shares its joy, Prov. 1410. We have to deal with what is in our soul, and boundaries help us to define what that is. If we are not shown the parameters, or are taught wrong parameters, we are in for much pain. The Bible tells us clearly what our parameters are and how to protect them, but often our family, or other past relationships, confuses us about our parameters. In addition to showing us what we are responsible for, boundaries help us to define what is not on our property and what we are not responsible for. We are not, for example, responsible for other people. Nowhere are we commanded to have other control, although we spend a lot of time and energy trying to get it. To and for we are responsible to others and for ourselves. Carry each other's burdens, says Galatians 6 2, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. This verse shows our responsibility to one. Another. Many times others have burdens that are too big to bear. They do not have enough strength, resources, or knowledge to carry the load, and they need help. Denying ourselves to do for authors what they cannot do for themselves is showing the sacrificial love of Christ. This is what Christ did for us. He did what we could not do for ourselves, He saved us. This is being responsible too. On the other hand, verse 5 says that each one should carry his own load. Everyone has responsibilities that only he or she can carry. These things are our own particular load that we need to take daily responsibility for and work out. No one can do certain things for us. We have to take ownership of certain aspects of life that are our own load. 
The Greek words for burden and load give us insight into the meaning of these texts. The Greek word for burden means excess burdens, or burdens that are so heavy that they weigh us down. These burdens are like boulders. They can crush us. We shouldn't be expected to carry a boulder by ourselves. It would break our backs. We need help with the boulders, those times of crisis and tragedy in our lives. In contrast, the Greek word for load means cargo, or the burden of daily toil. This word describes the everyday things we all need to do. These loads are like knapsacks. Knapsacks are possible to carry. We are expected to carry our own. We are expected to deal with our own feelings, attitudes, and behaviors, as well as the responsibilities God has given to each one of us, even though it takes effort. Problems arise when people act as if their boulders are daily loads, and refuse help, or as if their daily loads are boulders they shouldn't have to carry. The results of these two instances are either perpetual pain or irresponsibility. Lest we stay in pain or become irresponsible, it is very important to determine what me is, where my boundary of responsibility is and where someone else's begins. We will define what we are responsible for later in this chapter. For now let's look more closely at the nature of boundaries. Good in, bad out boundaries help us to distinguish our property so that we can take care of it. They help us to guard our heart with all diligence. We need to keep things that will nurture us inside our fences and keep things that will harm us outside. In short, boundaries help us keep the good in and the bad out. They guard our treasures, Matt. 7 to 6, so that people will not steal them. They keep the pearls inside, and the pigs outside. Sometimes, we have bad on the inside and good on the outside. In these instances, we need to be able to open up our boundaries to let the good in and the bad out. In other words, our fences need gates in them. For example, if I find that I have some pain or sin within, I need to open up and communicate it to God and others, so that I can be healed. Confessing pain and sin helps to get it out so that it does not continue to poison me on the inside, 1 John 1 9, James 5 16, Mark 7 21-23. What does a boundary look like? 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12 37 p.m. page 29. 30 And when the good is on the outside, we need to open our gates and let it in. Jesus speaks of this phenomenon in receiving Him and His truth. Rev. 3.20, John 1.12. Other people have good things to give us, and we need to open up to them, 2 Cor. 6.11-13. Often we will close our boundaries to good things from others, staying in a state of deprivation. In short, boundaries are not walls. The Bible does not say that we are to be walled off from others, in fact, it says that we are to be one with them, John 17.11. We are to be in calm community with them. But in every community, all members have their own space and property. The important thing is that property lines be permeable enough to allow passing and strong. Enough to keep out danger. Often, when people are abused while growing up, they reverse the function of boundaries and keep the bad in and the good out. When Mary was growing up she suffered abuse from her father. She was not encouraged to develop good boundaries. As a result, she would close herself off, holding the pain inside, she would not open up to express her hurt and get it out of her soul. She also would not open up to let support from the outside in to heal her. In addition, she would continually allow others to dump more pain into her soul. Consequently, when she came in for help, she was carrying a lot of pain, still being abused, and walled off from support from the outside. She had to reverse the ways her boundaries worked. She needed fences that were strong enough to keep the bad out and gates in those fences to let out the bad already in her soul and let in the good she desperately needed. God and boundaries The concept of boundaries comes from the very nature of God. God defines Himself as a distinct, separate being, and He is responsible for Himself. He defines and takes responsibility for His personality by telling us what He thinks, feels, plans, allows, will not allow, likes, and dislikes. He also defines Himself as separate from His creation and from us. He differentiates Himself from others. He tells us who He is and who He is not. 
For example, he says that he is love and that he is not darkness, 1 John 4 16, 1-6. In addition, he has boundaries within the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one, but at the same time they are distinct persons with their own boundaries. Each one has his own personhood and responsibilities, as well as a connection and love for one another, John 17 24. God also limits what He will allow in His yard. He confronts sin and allows consequences for behavior. He guards His house and will not allow evil things to go on there. He invites people in who will love Him, and He lets His love flow outward to them at the same time. The gates of His boundaries open and close appropriately. In the same way He gave us His likeness, General 1 26, He gave us personal responsibility within limits. He wants us to rule and subdue the earth and to be responsible stewards over the life He has given us. To do that, we need to develop boundaries like God's. Examples of boundaries Boundaries are anything that helps to differentiate you from someone else, or shows where you begin and end. Here are some examples of boundaries. Skin The most basic boundary that defines you is your physical skin. People often use this boundary as a metaphor for saying that their personal boundaries have been violated, he really gets under my skin. Your physical self is the first way that you learn that you are separate from others. As an infant, you slowly learn that you are different from the mother or father who cuddles you. The skin boundary keeps the good in and the bad out. It protects your blood and bones, holding them on the inside and all. Together, it also keeps germs outside, protecting you from infection. At the same time skin has openings that let the good in. Like food, and the bad out, like waste products. What does a boundary look like? 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12.37 p.m. Page 31 32 Victims of physical and sexual abuse often have a poor sense of boundaries. Early in life they were taught that their property did not really begin at their skin. Others could invade their property and do whatever they wanted. As a result, they have difficulty establishing boundaries later in life. Words in the physical world offense or some other kind of structure usually delineates a boundary. In the spiritual world, fences are invisible. Nevertheless, you can create good protective fences with your words. The most basic boundary setting word is no. It lets others know that you exist apart from them and that you are in control of you. Being clear about your no, and your yes, is a theme that runs throughout the Bible, Matt. 537, James 512. No is a confrontational word. The Bible says that we are to confront people we love, saying, no, that behavior is not okay. I will not participate in that. The word no is also important in setting limits on abuse. Many passages of Scripture urge us to say no to other sinful treatment of us, Matt. 1815-20. The Bible also warns us against giving to others reluctantly or under compulsion. 2 Cor. 9-7. People with poor boundaries struggle with saying no to the control, pressure, demands, and sometimes the real needs of others. They feel that if they say no to someone, they will endanger their relationship with that person, so they passively comply but inwardly resent. Sometimes a person is pressuring you to do something, other times the pressure comes from your own sense of what you should do. If you cannot say no to this external or internal pressure, you have lost control of your property and are not enjoying the fruit of self-control. Your words also define your property for others as you communicate your feelings, intentions, or dislikes. It is difficult for people to know where you stand when you do not use words to define your property. God does this when He says, I like this and I hate that. Or, I will do this, and I will not do that. Your words let people know where you stand and thus give them a sense of the edges that help identify you. I don't like it when you yell at me. Gives people a clear message about how you conduct relationships and lets them know the rules of your yard. Truth knowing the truth about God and His property puts limits on you and shows you His boundaries. Realizing the truth of His unchangeable reality helps you to define yourself in relation to Him. When He says that you will reap what you sow, Gal? 6 to 7. For example, you either define yourself in relation to that real itty, or continue to get injured if you try to go against it. 
to be in. Touch with God's truth is to be in touch with reality, and to live in accord with that reality makes for a better life, Ps. 119-2, 45. Satan is the great distorter of reality. Recall in the garden when he tempted Eve to question God's boundaries and his truth. The consequences were disastrous. There is always safety in the truth, whether it be knowing God's truth or knowing the truth about yourself. Many people live scattered and tumultuous lives trying to live outside of their own boundaries, not accepting and expressing the truth of who they are. Honesty about who you are gives you the biblical value of integrity, or oneness. Geographical distance Proverbs 22 3 says that the prudent man sees the evil and hides himself. Sometimes physically removing yourself from a situation will help maintain boundaries. You can do this to replenish yourself physically, emotionally, and spiritually after you have given to your limit, as Jesus often did. Or, you can remove yourself to get away from danger and put limits on evil. The Bible urges us to separate from those who continue to hurt us and to create a safe place for ourselves. Removing yourself from the situation will also cause the one who is left behind to experience a loss of fellowship that may lead to changed behavior, Matt. 1817-18, 1 Cor. 511-13. What does a boundary look like? O one dot boundaries May 14, 2001 12 37 p.m. page 33. 34 When a relationship is abusive, many times the only way to finally show the other person that your boundaries are real is to create space until they are ready to deal with the problem. The Bible supports the idea of limiting togetherness for the sake of binding evil. Time taking time off from a person, or a project, can be a way of regaining ownership over some out of control aspect of your life where boundaries need to be set. Adult children who have never spiritually and emotionally separated from their parents often need time away. They have spent their whole lives embracing and keeping, Ickle. 3 to 5 to 6, and have been afraid to refrain from embracing and to throw away some of their outgrown ways of relating. They need to spend some time building boundaries against the old ways and creating new ways of relating that for a while may feel alienating too. Their parents. This time apart usually improves their relationship with their parents. Emotional distance Emotional distance is a temporary boundary to give your heart the space it needs to be safe, it is never a permanent way of living. People who have been in abusive relationships need to find a safe place to begin to thaw out emotionally. Sometimes in abusive marriages the abused spouse needs to keep emotional. Distance until the abusive partner begins to face his or her problems and become trustworthy. You should not continue to set yourself up for hurt and disappointment. If you have been in an abusive relationship, you should wait until it is safe and until real patterns of change have been demonstrated before you go back. Many people are too quick to trust someone in the name of forgiveness and not make sure that the other is producing fruit in keeping with repentance, Luke 3 8. To continue to open yourself up emotionally to an abusive or addicted person without seeing true change is foolish. Forgive, but guard your heart until you see sustained change. Other people you need to depend on others to help you set and keep. Boundaries. People subject to another person's addictions, control, or abuse are finding that after years and years of loving too much, they can find the ability to create boundaries only through a support group. Their support system is giving them the strength to say no to abuse and control for the first time in their lives. There are two reasons why you need others to help with boundaries. The first is that your most basic need in life is for relationship. People suffer much to have relationships, and many put up with abuse because they fear their partners will leave them and they will be alone if they stand up to them. Fear of being alone keeps many in hurtful patterns for years. They are afraid that if they set boundaries they will not have any love in their life. When they open themselves up to support from others, however, they find that the abusive person is not the only source of love in the world and that they can find the strength through their support system to set the limits they need to set. They are no longer alone. The Church of Christ is there to give strength to ward off the blows against them. The other reason we need others is because we need new input and teaching. Many people have been taught by their church or their family that boundaries are unbiblical, mean, or selfish. These people need good biblical support systems to help them stand against the guilt that comes from the old tapes inside that tell them lies to keep them in bondage. 
they need support of others to stand against the old messages and the guilt involved in change. In part 2 we will be discussing in greater detail how to build boundaries in all the primary relationships in your life. Our point for now is that boundaries are not built in a vacuum, creating boundaries always involves a support network. What does a boundary look like? 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 37 p.m. page 35. 36. Consequences Trespassing on other people's property carries consequences. No trespassing signs usually carry a threat of prosecution if someone steps over the boundaries. The Bible teaches this principle over and over, saying that if we walk one way, this will happen, and if we walk another way, something else will happen. Just as the Bible sets consequences for certain behaviors, we need to back up our boundaries with consequences. How many marriages could have been saved if one spouse had followed? Through with the threat of if you don't stop drinking, or coming home at midnight, or hitting me, or yelling at the kids. I will leave until you get some treatment. Or how many young adults' lives would have been turned around if their parents had followed through with their threat of no more money if you quit another job without having further employment or no bed if you continue to smoke marijuana in my house. Paul is not kidding in 2 Thessalonians 3:10 when he says that if anyone will not work, don't let him or her eat. God does not. Enable irresponsible behavior. Hunger is a consequence of laziness, Prov. 1626. Consequences give some good barbs to fences. They let people know the seriousness of the trespass and the seriousness of our respect for ourselves. This teaches them that our commitment to living according to helpful values is something we hold dear and will fight to protect and guard. What's within my boundaries? The story of the Good Samaritan is a model of correct behavior in many dimensions. It is a good illustration of boundaries, when they should be both observed and violated. I mag in for a moment how the story might read if the Samaritan were a boundaryless person. You know the story. A man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho was mugged. The robber stripped him and beat him, leaving him half dead. A priest and Levite passed by on the other side of the road, ignoring the hurt man, but a Samaritan took pity on him, bandaged his wounds, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day the Samaritan gave the innkeeper some money and said, look after him. When I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Let's depart from the familiar story here. Suppose the injured man wakes up at this point in the story and says, what? You're leaving? Yes. I am. I have some business in Jericho I have to attend to, the Samaritan replies. Don't you think you're being selfish? I'm in pretty bad shape here. I'm going to need someone to talk to. How is Jesus going to use you as an example? You're not even acting like a Christian, abandoning me like this in my time of need. Whatever happened to deny yourself? Question mark. Why, I guess you're right, the Samaritan says. That would be uncaring of me to leave you here alone. I should do more. I will postpone my trip for a few days. So he stays with the man for three days, talking to him and making sure that he is happy and content. On the afternoon of the third day, there's a knock at the door and a messenger comes. In? He hands the Samaritan a message from his business contacts in Jericho, waited as long as we could. Have decided to sell camels to another party. Our next herd will be here in six months. How could you do this to me? The Samaritan screams at the recovering man, waving the message in the air. Look what you've done now. You've caused me to lose those camels that I needed for my business. Now I can't deliver my goods. This may put me out of business. How could you do this to me? At some level this story may be familiar to all of us. We may be moved with compassion to give to someone in need but then this person manipulates us into giving more than we want to give. We end up resentful and angry, having missed something. We need it in our own life. Or, we may want more from someone else, and we pressure them until they give in. They give not out of their heart and free will, but out of compliance, and they resent us for what they give. Neither one of us comes out ahead. What does a boundary look like? 
1.01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12.37 p.m. Page 37. 38. To avoid these scenarios, we need to look at what falls within our boundaries, what we are responsible for. Feelings feelings have gotten a bad rap in the Christian world. They have been called everything from unimportant to fleshly. At the same time, example after example shows how our feelings play an enormous role in our motivation and behavior. How many times have you seen people do ungodly things to one another because of hurt feelings? Or how many times has someone had to be hospitalized for depression after years and years of trying to ignore the way they felt until they became suicidal? Feelings should neither be ignored nor placed in charge. The Bible says to own your feelings and be aware of them. They can often motivate you to do much good. The Good Samaritan's pity moved him to go to the injured Israelite, Luke 10:33. The father was filled with compassion for his lost son and threw his arms around him, Luke 15:20. Many times Jesus had compassion for the people to whom he ministered, Matt. 9:36, 15:32. Feelings come from your heart and can tell you the state of your relationships. They can tell you if things are going well, or if there is a problem. If you feel close and loving, things are probably going well. If you feel angry, you have a problem that needs to be addressed. But the point is, your feelings are your responsibility and you must own them and see them as your problem so you can begin to find an answer to whatever issue they are pointing to. Attitudes and Beliefs Attitudes have to do with your orientation toward something, the stance you take toward others, God, life, work, and relationships. Beliefs are anything that you accept as true. Often we do not see an attitude, or belief, as the source of discomfort in our life. We blame other people as did our first parents, Adam and Eve. We need to own our attitudes and convictions because they fall within our property line. We are the ones who feel their effect, and the only ones who can change them. The tough thing about attitudes is that we learn them very early in life. They play a big part in the map of who we are and how we operate. People who have never questioned their attitudes and beliefs can fall prey to the dynamic that Jesus referred to when he described people holding on to the traditions of men, instead of the commands of God, Mark 7 8, Matt 15-3. People with boundary problems usually have distorted attitudes about responsibility. They feel that to hold people responsible for their feelings, choices, and behaviors is mean. However, Proverbs repeatedly says that setting limits and accepting responsibility will save lives, Prov. 13 18, 24. Behaviors Behaviors have consequences. As Paul says, a man reaps what he sows, Gal. 6-7-8. If we study, we will reap good grades. If we go to work, we will get a paycheck. If we exercise, we will be in better health. If we act lovingly toward others, we will have closer relationships. On the negative side, if we sow idleness, irresponsibility, or out-of-control behavior, we can expect to reap poverty, failure, and the effects of loose living. These are natural consequences of our behavior. The problem comes when someone interrupts the law of sowing and reaping in another's life. A person's drinking or abuse should have consequences for the drinker or the abuser. Stern discipline awaits him who leaves the path, Prov. 1510. To rescue people from the natural consequences of their behavior is to render them powerless. This happens a lot with parents and children. Parents often yell and nag instead of allowing their children to reap the natural consequences of their behavior. Parenting with love and limits, with warmth and consequences, produces confident children who have a sense of control over their lives. What does a boundary look like? 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 1237 p.m. page 39. 40 Choices We Need to Take Responsibility for Our Choices. This leads to the fruit of self-control, gal. 523. A common boundary problem is disowning our choices and trying to lay the responsibility for them on someone else. Think for a moment how often we use the phrases, I had to or she, he, made me when explaining why we did or did not do something. These phrases betray 
our basic illusion that we are not active agents in many of our dealings. We think someone else is in control, thus relieving us of our basic responsibility. We need to realize that we are in control of our choices, no matter how we feel. This keeps us from making choices to give reluctantly or under compulsion, as 2 Corinthians 9 7 says. Paul would not even accept a gift that he felt was given because the giver felt he had to give it. He once sent a gift back so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced, Philem. 1 14. Joshua said the same thing to the people in his famous choice verse, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, Josh. 24 15. Jesus said a similar thing to the worker who was angry about the wage for which he had agreed to work, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Matt. 2013. The man had made a free choice to work for a certain amount and was angry because someone who had worked fewer hours had gotten the same wage. Another example is the prodigal son's brother, who had chosen to stay home and serve and then was resentful. Not satisfied. With his choice, he needed to be reminded that he made a choice to stay home. Throughout the scriptures, people are reminded of their choices and asked to take responsibility for them. Like Paul says, If we choose to live by the Spirit, we will live, if we choose to fall low our sinful nature, we will die, Rom. 8.13. Making decisions. Based on others' approval or on guilt breeds resentment, a product of our sinful nature. We have been so trained by others on what we should do that we think we are being loving when we do things out of compulsion. Setting boundaries inevitably involves taking responsibility for your choices. You are the one who makes them. You are the one who must live with their consequences. And you are the one who may be keeping yourself from making the choices you could be happy with. Values what we value is what we love and assign importance to. Often we do not take responsibility for what we value. We are caught up in valuing the approval of men rather than the approval of God, John 12 43, because of this misplaced value, we miss out on life. We think that power, riches, and pleasure will satisfy our deepest longing, which is really for love. When we take responsibility for out-of-control behavior caused by loving the wrong things, or valuing things that have no lasting value, when we confess that we have a heart that values things that will not satisfy, we can receive help from God and His people to create a new heart within us. Boundaries help us not to deny but to own our old hurtful values so God can change them. Limits Two aspects of limits stand out when it comes to creating better boundaries. The first is setting limits on others. This is the component that we most often hear about when we talk about boundaries. In reality, setting limits on others is a misnomer. We can't do that. What we can do is set limits on our own exposure to people who are behaving poorly, we can't change them or make them behave right. Our model is God. He does not really set limits on people to make them behave. God sets standards, but He lets people be who they are and then separates Himself from them when they misbehave, saying in effect, you can be that way if you choose, but you cannot come into my house. Heaven is a place for the repentant, and all are welcome but God limits His exposure to evil, unrepentant people, as should we. Scripture is full of admonitions to separate ourselves. What does a boundary look like? 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12.37 p.m. Page 41. 42. From people who act in destructive ways, Matt. 18.15-17, 1 Cor. 5-9-13. We are not being unloving. Separating ourselves protects love, because we are taking a stand against things that destroy love. The other aspect of limits that is helpful when talking about boundaries is setting our own internal limits. We need to have spaces inside ourselves where we can have a feeling, an impulse, or a desire, without acting it out. We need self-control without repression. We need to be able to say no to ourselves. This includes both our destructive desires and some good ones that are not wise to pursue at a given time. Internal structure is a very important component of boundaries and identity, as well as ownership, responsibility, and self-control. Talents contrast these two responses. Well done, good and faithful servant. 
you have been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest. Where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on. Deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. Matt. 25 23 26 to 28 No other passage better illustrates God ordained responsibility for ownership and use of talents. Although the example is of money, it also applies to internal talents and gifts. Our talents are clearly within our boundaries and are our responsibility. Yet taking ownership of them is often frightening and always risky. The parable of the talent says that we are accountable, not to mention much happier, when we are exercising our gifts and being productive. It takes work, practice, learning, prayer, resources, and grace to overcome the fear of failure that the wicked and lazy servant gave in to. He was not chastised for being afraid, we are all afraid when trying something new and difficult. He was chastised for not confronting his fear and trying the best he could. Not confronting our fear denies the grace of God and insults both His giving of the gift and His grace to sustain us as we are learning. Thoughts are minds and thoughts are important reflections of the image of God. No other creature on earth has our thinking ability. We are the only creatures who are called to love God with all our mind, Mark 12 30. And Paul wrote that he was taking captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, 2 Cor. 10-5. Establishing boundaries in thinking involves three things. 1. We must own our own thoughts. Many people have not taken ownership of their own thinking processes. They are mechanically thinking the thoughts of others without ever examining them. They swallow others' opinions and reasonings, never questioning and thinking about their thinking. Certainly we should listen to the thoughts of others and weigh them, but we should never give our minds over to anyone. We are to weigh things for ourselves in the context of relationship, sharpening each other as iron, but remaining separate thinkers. 2. We must grow in knowledge and expand our minds. One area in which we need to grow is in knowledge of God and His Word. David said of knowing God's Word, My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. Your statutes are My delight, they are my counselors, peas. 119-20, 119 20, 24. We also learn much about God by studying His creation and His work. In learning about His world, we obey the commandment to rule and subdue the earth and all that is within it. We must learn about the world that He has given us to become wise stewards. Whether we are doing brain surgery, balancing our checkbook, or raising children, we are to use our brains to have better lives and glorify God. 3. We must clarify distorted thinking. We all have a tendency to not see things clearly, to think and perceive and distorted. What does a boundary look like? 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 1237 p.m. page 43. 44 ways. Probably the easiest distortions to notice are in personal. Relationships. We rarely see people as they really are. Our perceptions are distorted by past relationships and our own preconceptions of who we think they are even the people we know. Best. We do not see clearly because of the logs in our eyes, Matt. 7-3-5. Taking ownership of our thinking in relationships requires being active and checking out where we may be wrong. As we assimilate new information, our thinking adapts and grows closer to reality. Also we need to make sure that we are communicating our thoughts to others. Many people think that others should be able to read their minds and know what they want. This leads to frustration. Even Paul says, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? 1 Cor. 2.11. What a great statement about boundaries. We have our own thoughts, and if we want others to know them, we must tell them. Desires. Our desires lie within our boundaries. Each of us has different desires and wants, dreams and wishes, goals and plans hungers and thirsts. We all want to satisfy me. 
but why are there so few satisfied me's around? Part of the problem lies in the lack of structured boundaries within our personality. We can't define who the real me is and what we truly desire. Many desires masquerade as the real thing. They are lusts that come out of not owning our real desires. For example, many sex addicts are looking for sexual experiences, but what they really desire is love and affection. James writes about this problem of not owning and seeking our real desires with pure motives, you want something but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures, James 4 2-3. We often do not actively seek our desires from God, and those desires are mixed up with things that we do not really need. God is truly interested in our desires, He made them. Consider the following, you have granted Him the desire of His heart and have not withheld the request of His lips. You well come at Him with rich blessings and placed a crown of pure gold on His head, peas. 21-2-3. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart, peas. 37-4. He fulfills the desires of those who fear Him, peas. 145-19. God loves to give gifts to His children, but He is a wise parent. He wants to make sure His gifts are right for us. To know what to ask for, we have to be in touch with who we really are and what are our real motives. If we are wanting something to feed our pride or to enhance our ego, I doubt that God is interested in giving it to us. But if it would be good for us, He's very interested. We are also commanded to play an active role in seeking our desires. Phil. 2-12-13, ECC. 11-9, Matt. 7-7-11. We need to own our desires and pursue them to find fulfillment in life. A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, Prov. 13-19 KJV, but it sure is a lot of work. Love our ability to give and respond to love is our greatest gift. The heart that God has fashioned in His image is the center of our being. Its abilities to open up to love and to allow love to flow outward are crucial to life. Many people have difficulty giving and receiving love because of hurt and fear. Having closed their heart to others, they feel empty and meaningless. The Bible is clear about both functions of the heart, the receiving of grace and love inward and the flow outward. Listen to how the Bible tells how we should love, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself, Matt. 22 37, 39. And how we should receive love, we have spoken. What does a boundary look like? 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12 37 p.m. page 45. 46 Freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also, 2 Cor. 6 11-13. Our loving heart, like our physical one, needs an inflow as well as an outflow of lifeblood. And like its physical counterpart, our heart is a muscle, a trust muscle. This trust muscle needs to be used and exercised, if it is injured it will slow down or weaken. We need to take responsibility for this loving function of ourselves and use it. Love concealed or love rejected can both kill us. Many people do not take ownership for how they resist love. They have a lot of love around them, but do not realize that their loneliness is a result of their own lack of responsiveness. Often they will say, others' love cannot get in. This statement negates their responsibility to respond. We maneuver subtly to avoid responsibility in love, we need to claim our hearts as our property and work on our weaknesses in that area. It will open up life to us. We need to take responsibility for all of the above areas of our souls. These lie within our boundaries. But taking care of what lies within our boundaries isn't easy, neither is allowing other people to take care of what lies within their boundaries. Setting boundaries and maintaining them is hard work. But, as you'll see in the next chapter, boundary problems take some very recognizable shapes. 3. Boundary Problems 
following a day-long seminar that we were leading on Biblical boundaries, a woman raised her hand and said, I understand that I have boundary problems. But my estranged husband's the one who had an affair and took all our money. Doesn't he have a problem with boundaries? It's easy to misunderstand boundaries. At first glance, it seems as if the individual who has difficulty setting limits is the one who has the boundary problem, however, people who don't respect others' limits also have boundary problems. The woman above may have difficulty setting limits, but, in addition, her husband hasn't respected her limits. In this chapter, we'll categorize the main types of boundary problems, providing you some pegs on which to hang your thoughts. You'll see that boundary conflicts are by no means limited to those who can't say no. Compliance, saying yes to the bad may I tell you something embarrassing? Robert asked me. A new client, Robert was trying to understand why he had so much difficulty refusing his wife's constant demands. He was going broke trying to keep up with the Joneses. I was the only boy in my family, the youngest of four children. There was a strange double standard in my house involving physical fighting. Robert cleared his throat, struggling to continue. My sisters were three to seven years older than me. 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12.37 p.m. Page 47. 48. Until I was in sixth grade, they were a lot bigger and stronger. They'd take advantage of their size and strength and wale on me until I was bruised. I mean, they really hurt me. The strangest part of it all was my parents' attitude. They'd tell us, Robert is the boy. Boys don't hit girls. It's bad manners. Bad manners? I was getting triple teamed, and fighting back was. Bad manners? Robert stopped. His shame kept him from continuing, but he'd said enough. He had unearthed part of the Rhea son for his conflicts with his wife. When parents teach children that setting boundaries or saying no is bad, they are teaching them that others can do with them as they wish. They are sending their children defenseless into a world that contains much evil. Evil in the form of controlling, manipulative, and exploitative people. Evil in the form of temptations. To feel safe in such an evil world, children need to have the power to say things like, No. I disagree. I will not. I choose not to. Stop that. It hurts. It's wrong. That's bad. I don't like it when you touch me there. Blocking a child's ability to say no handicaps the child for life. Adults with handicaps like Roberts have this first boundary injury. They say yes to bad things. This type of boundary conflict is called compliance. Compliant people have fuzzy and indistinct boundaries, they melt into the demands and needs of other people. They can't stand alone. Distinct from people who want something from them. Compliants, for example, pretend to like the same restaurants and movies their friends do just to get along. They minimize their differences with others so as not to rock the boat. Compliants are chameleons. After a while it's hard to distinguish them from their environment. The inability to say no to the bad is pervasive. Not only does it keep us from refusing evil in our lives, it often keeps us from recognizing evil. Many compliant people realize too late that they're in a dangerous or abusive relationship. Their spiritual and emotional radar is broken, they have no ability to guard their hearts, Prov. 423. This type of boundary problem paralyzes people's no muscles. Whenever they need to protect themselves by saying no. The word catches in their throats. This happens for a number of different reasons. Fear of hurting the other person's feelings, fear of abandonment and separateness, a wish to be totally dependent on another, fear of someone else's anger, fear of punishment, fear of being shamed, fear of being seen as bad or selfish, fear of being unspiritual, fear of one's overstrict, critical conscience this last fear is actually experienced as guilt. People who have an overstrict, critical conscience will condemn themselves for things God himself doesn't condemn them for. As Paul says, since their conscience is weak, it is defiled, one core. 8-7. Afraid to confront their unbiblical and critical internal parent, they tighten appropriate boundaries. When we give in to guilty feelings, we are complying with a harsh conscience. 
this fear of disobeying the harsh conscience translates into an inability to confront others, a saying yes to the bad, because it would cause more guilt. Biblical compliance needs to be distinguished from this kind of compliance. Matthew 9:13 says that God desires compassion, and not sacrifice, NASB. In other words, God wants us to be compliant from the inside out, compassionate, not compliant on the outside and resentful on the inside, sacrificial. Compliance take on too many responsibilities and set too few boundaries, not by choice, but because they are afraid. Boundary Problems 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12 37 p.m. page 49. 50. Avoidance, saying no to the good the living room suddenly became very quiet. The Bible study group that had been meeting at the Craig's house for six months had suddenly become more intimate. Tonight the five couples began to share real struggles in their lives, not just the usual pleas. Pray for Aunt Sarah requests. Tears were shed, and genuine support, not just well-meaning advice, was offered. Everyone, except. The hostess, Rachel Henderson, had taken a turn talking. Rachel had been the driving force behind the formation of the Bible study. She and her husband, Joe, had developed the format, invited the other couples, and opened up their home to the study. Caught up in her leadership role, however, Rachel never opened up about her struggles. She shied away from such opportunities, preferring instead to help draw out others. Tonight the others waited. Rachel cleared her throat. Looking around the room, she finally spoke, after hearing all the other problems in the room, I think the Lord's speaking to me. He seems to be saying that my issues are nothing compared to what you all deal with. It would be selfish to take up time with the little struggles I face. So, who'd like dessert? No one spoke. But disappointment was evident on each face. Rachel had again avoided an opportunity for others to love her as they'd been loved by her. This boundary problem is called avoidance, saying no to the good. It's the inability to ask for help, to recognize one's own needs, to let others in. Avoidance withdraw when they are in need, they do not ask for the support of others. Why is avoidance a boundary problem? At the heart of the struggle is a confusion of boundaries as walls. Boundaries are supposed to be able to breathe, to be like fences with a gate that can let the good in and the bad out. Individuals with walls for boundaries can let in neither bad nor good. No one touches them. God designed our personal boundaries to have gates. We should have the freedom to enjoy safe relationships and to avoid destructive ones. God even allows us the freedom to let Him in or to close Him off. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. Rev. 3.20, God has no interest in violating our boundaries so that he can relate to us. He understands that this would cause injuries of trust. It is our responsibility to open up to him in need and repentance. Yet, for avoidance, opening up to both God and people is almost impossible. The impermeable boundaries of avoidance cause a rigidity toward their God-given needs. They experience their problems and legitimate wants as something bad, destructive, or shameful. Some people, like Marty, are both compliance and avoidance. In a recent session, Marty laughed ruefully at herself. I'm beginning to see a pattern here. When someone needs four hours with me, I can't say no. When I need someone for ten minutes, I can't ask for it. Isn't there a transistor in my head that I can replace? Marty's dilemma is shared by many adults. She says yes to the bad, compliant, and says no to the good, avoidant. Individuals who have both boundary conflicts not only cannot refuse evil, they are unable to receive the support they so readily offer to others. They are stuck in a cycle of feeling drained, but with nothing to replace the lost energy. Compliant avoidants suffer from what is called reversed boundaries. They have no boundaries where they need them, and they have boundaries where they shouldn't have them. Controllers, not respecting others' boundaries what do you mean, you're quitting. You can't leave now. Steve looked across his desk at his administrative assistant. Frank had been working for Steve for several years and was finally fed up. He had given his all to the position, but Steve didn't know when to back off. Time after time, 
Steve would insist on Frank spending unpaid time at the office on important projects. Frank had even switched his vacation schedule twice at Steve's insistence. But. Boundary problems. 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 1237 p.m. Page 51. 52. The final straw was when Steve began calling Frank at home. An occasional call at home Frank could understand. But almost every day, during dinner time, the family would wait while Frank had a telephone conference with his boss. Several times Frank had tried to talk with Steve about the time violations. But Steve never really understood how burned out Frank was. After all, he needed Frank. Frank made him look successful. And it was so easy to get him to work harder. Steve has a problem hearing and accepting others' boundaries. To Steve, no is simply a challenge to change the other person's mind. This boundary problem is called control. Controllers can't respect others' limits. They resist taking responsibility for their own lives, so they need to control others. Controllers believe the old jokes about training top salespeople, no means maybe, and maybe means yes. While this may be productive in learning to sell a product, it can wreak havoc in a relationship. Controllers are perceived as bullies, manipulative and aggressive. The primary problem of individuals who can't hear no, which is different from not being able to say no, is that they tend to project responsibility for their lives onto others. They use various means of control to motivate others to carry the load intended by God to be theirs alone. Remember the boulder and knapsack illustration in chapter. 2. Controllers look for someone to carry their knapsacks, individual responsibilities, in addition to their boulders, crises and crushing burdens. Had Steve shouldered the weight of his own job, Frank would have been happy to pitch in extra hours from time to time. But the pressure of covering for Steve's irresponsibility made a talented professional look elsewhere for work. Controllers come in two types. 1. Aggressive controllers. These people clearly don't listen to others' boundaries. They run over other people's fences like a tank. They are sometimes verbally abusive, sometimes physically. Abusive. But most of the time they simply aren't aware that authors even have boundaries. It's as if they live in a world of yes. There's no place for someone else's no. They attempt to get authors to change, to make the world fit their idea of the way life should be. They neglect their own responsibility to accept authors as they are. Peter is an example of an aggressive controller. Jesus was telling the disciples about his upcoming suffering, death, and resurrection. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men, Mark 8:33. Peter didn't want to accept the Lord's boundaries. Jesus immediately confronted Peter's violation of his boundaries. 2. Manipulative controllers. Less honest than the aggressive controllers, manipulators try to persuade people out of their boundaries. They talk others into yes. They indirectly manipulate circumstances to get their way. They seduce others into car rying their burdens. They use guilt messages. Remember how Tom Sawyer tricked his playmates into whitewashing the fence for him? He made it seem like such a privilege that kids were lined up to paint. Isaac's son Jacob finagled his twin brother Esau into giving up his birthright, General 25 29-34, and, with his mother's help, deceived his father into bestowing Esau's blessing on him, General 27-1-29. In fact, Jacob's name means deceiver. Numerous times he used his cleverness to avoid others' boundaries. The event that helped Jacob work out of his manipulative boundarylessness was his confrontation with God in human form, General 32 32 God wrestled with him all night long and then changed his name to Israel. The word Israel means he who fights with God. God left Jacob with a dislocated thigh. And Jacob changed. He became less deceitful and more honest. His aggressiveness was clearer, as evidenced by his new name. He was owning his feistiness. Only when the manipulative controller is confronted with his dishonesty can he take responsibility for it, reap it of it, and accept his and others' limits. 
Manipulators deny their desires to control others, they brush aside their own self-centeredness. They are like the adulteress. Boundary Problems 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 1237 PM Page 53 54 Woman in Proverbs, she eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. 3020. Believe it or not, compliance and avoidance can also be controllers. They tend, however, to be more manipulative than aggressive. When compliant avoidance need emotional support, for example, they may do a favor for a friend. They hope that by being loving, they'll receive love. So then they wait, anticipating the return of the favor. And sometimes they wait for years. Especially if they perform the favor for someone who can't read minds. What's wrong with this picture? It's not a picture of love. The love that God talks about doesn't seek a return on its investment, it is not self-seeking, one core. 13-5. Caring for someone so that they'll care back for us is simply an indirect means of controlling someone else. If you've ever been on the receiving end of that kind of maneuver, you'll understand. One minute you've taken the compliment, or favor, the next minute you've hurt someone's feelings by not figuring out the price tag attached. Boundary injuries at this point, you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute. How can controllers be called injured? They are the injurers, not the injured. Indeed, controllers do lots of damage to others, but they also have boundary problems. Let's see what goes on underneath. Controllers are undisciplined people. They have little ability to curb their impulses or desires. While it appears that they get what they want in life, they are still slaves to their appetites. Delaying gratification is difficult for them. That's why they hate. The word no from others. They desperately need to learn to least tend to the boundaries of others to help them observe their own. Controllers also are limited in their ability to take responsibility for owning their lives. Having relied on bullying or indirectness, they can't function on their own in the world. The only remedy is to let controllers experience the consequences of their irresponsibility. Finally, controllers are isolated. People stay with them out of fear, guilt, or dependency. If they're honest, controllers rarely feel loved. Why? Because in their heart of hearts, they know that the only reason people spend time with them is because they are pulling the strings. If they stopped threatening or manipulating, they would be abandoned. And, at some deep level, they are aware of their isolation. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear, 1 John 4 18. We can't terrorize or make others feel guilty and be loved by them at the same time. Non-responsives, not hearing the needs of others Brenda's hand trembled as she talked. Usually I've got pretty thick skin with Mike. But I guess the past couple of weeks of kid problems and work stresses had me feeling very vulnerable. This time his response didn't make me angry. It just hurt. And it hurt bad. Brenda was recounting a recent marital struggle. Overall, she thought her marriage to Mike was a good one. He was a good provider, an active Christian, and a competent father. Yet the relationship allowed no room for her hurts or needs. The incident Brenda was discussing began in a fairly benign manner. She and Mike were talking in the bedroom after putting the kids to bed. Brenda began to unburden her fears about child-rearing and her feelings of inadequacy at work. Without warning, Mike turned to her and said, If you don't like the way you feel, change your feelings. Life's tough. So just. Just handle it, Brenda. Brenda was devastated. She felt she should have expected the rebuff. It wasn't that easy to express her neediness in the first place, especially with Mike's coldness. Now she felt as if he had chopped her feelings to bits. He seemed to have no understanding whatsoever of her struggles, and didn't want to. How could this be a boundary problem? Isn't it just basic insensitivity? Partially. But it's not quite that simple. Remember. That boundaries are a way to describe our spheres of responsibility, what we are and are not responsible for. While we. Boundary Problems. 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001 12.37 p.m. Page 55. 56. Shouldn't take on the responsibility of others' feelings, 
attitudes, and behaviors, we do have certain responsibilities to each other. Mike does have a responsibility to connect with Brenda, not only as a provider and as a parenting partner, but also as a loving husband. Connecting emotionally with Brenda is part of loving her as himself, f. 528, 33. He isn't responsible for her emotional well-being, but he is responsible to her. His inability to respond to her needs is a neglect of his responsibility, termed non-responsives because of their lack of attention. To the responsibilities of love, these individuals exhibit the opposite side of the pattern exhorted in Proverbs 3.27, NRSV, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power to do it, that last phrase, in your power, has to do with our resources and availability. Another key scripture here is if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, Rom. 12.18 NRSV. Again, note the condition, so far as it depends on you, we can't bring peace to someone who doesn't accept it. Both of the above verses indicate the same idea, we are responsible to care about and help, within certain limits, others whom God places in our lives. To refuse to do so when we have the appropriate resources can be a boundary conflict. Non-responsives fall into one of two groups. 1. Those with a critical spirit toward others' needs, a project tie-in of our own hatred of our needs onto others, a problem Jesus. Addressed in Matthew 7 1-5. They hate being incomplete in themselves. As a result, they ignore the needs of others. 2. Those who are so absorbed in their own desires and needs they exclude others, a form of narcissism. Don't confuse this self-absorption with a God-given sense of taking responsibility for one's own needs first so that one is able to love others. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Phil. 2-4. God wants us to take care of ourselves so that we can help others without moving into a crisis ourselves. Controllers and non-responsives Controlling non-responsives have a hard time looking past themselves. They see others as responsible for their struggles and are on the lookout for someone to take care of them. They gravitate towards someone with blurry boundaries, who will naturally take on too many responsibilities in the relationship and who won't complain about it. It's like the old joke about relationships. What happens when a rescuing, enabling person meets a controlling, insensitive person? Answer, they get married. Actually, this makes sense. Compliant avoidance search for someone to repair. This keeps them saying yes and keeps them out of touch with their own needs. Who fits the bill better than a controlling non-responsive? And controlling non-responsive search for someone to keep them away from responsibility. Who better than a compliant avoidant? Below is a chart of the four types of boundary problems. One, it will help you see at a glance the kinds of problems with which you may struggle. Summary of boundary problems can't say, can't hear, know the compliant, the controller feels guilty and or aggressively or controlled by others, manipulatively violates, can't set boundaries, boundaries of others, yes, the non responsive, the avoidant sets boundaries against, sets boundaries against responsibility to love, receiving care of others, functional and relational boundary issues. A final boundary problem involves the distinction between functional and relational boundaries. Functional boundaries refers to a person's ability to complete a task, project, or job. It. Boundary Problems. 01. Boundaries May 14, 2001, 12 37 p.m., page 57. 58 has to do with performance, discipline, initiative, and planning. Relational boundaries refers to the ability to speak truth to authors with whom we are in relationship. Another way of looking at it is that functional boundaries refer to our Martha parts, and relational, our Mary parts, Luke 10 38 42. Mary and Martha were friends of Jesus. Martha prepared dinner, while Mary sat at Jesus' feet. When Martha complained about Mary's not helping her, Jesus said, Mary has chosen what is better, v. 42. He didn't mean that Martha's busyness was bad, it was just the wrong thing at the wrong time. Many people have good functional boundaries, but poor. Relational ones, that is, they can perform tasks at quite high levels of competence, but they may not be able to tell a friend that. They don't like their chronic lateness. The reverse can also be true. 
Some people can be absolutely honest with others about their complaints and dislikes but be unable to get up for work in the morning. We've taken a look at the different categories of boundaries. But how do you develop boundaries? Why do some people seem to have natural boundaries and others have no boundaries at all? As with many things, it has a lot to do with the family in which you grew up. 4. How boundaries are developed. Jim had never been able to say no to anyone, especially to his supervisors at work. He'd moved up to the position of operations manager in a large firm. His dependability had earned him the reputation of Mr. Can Do. But his kids had another name for him, the Phantom. Jim was never home. Being Mr. Can Do meant late nights at the office. It meant business dinners several nights a week. It meant weekends on the road, even after he'd promised the kids fishing trips and trips to the zoo. Jim didn't like being absent so much, but he had justified it to himself, saying, this is my contribution to the kids, my way of giving them the good life. His wife, Alice, had rationalized the dadless dinners by telling the children, and herself, this is dad's way of telling us he loves us. And she almost believed it. Finally, however, Alice had had enough. One night she sat Jim down on the couch in the family room and said, I feel like a single parent, Jim. I missed you for a while, but now all I feel is nothing. Jim avoided her eyes. Honey, I know, I know, he replied. I'd really like to say no to people more, but it's just so hard too, I found someone you can say no to, Alice broke in. Me and the kids. That did it. Something broke deep within Jim. A sense of pain, of guilt and shame, of helplessness and rage. The words tumbled out of his mouth. Do you think I like being like this, always giving in to others? Do you think I enjoy? Oh one dot boundaries May 14, 2001 12 37 p.m. page 59. 60 letting my family down? Jim paused, struggling for composure. All my life it's been this way, Alice. I've always feared letting people down. I hate this part of me. I hate my life. How did I get like this? How did Jim get like this? He loved his family. The last thing he wanted was to neglect his most precious relationships, his wife and children. Jim's problems didn't start the day he was married. They developed during his early significant relationships. They were already a part of his character structure. How do boundary abilities develop? That's the purpose of this chapter. We hope you'll be able to gain some understanding of where your own boundaries started crumbling or became set in concrete, and how to repair them. As you read this section, remember David's prayer to God about his life and development, search me, O God, and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Peace. 139-23-24, God's desire is for you to know where your injuries and deficits are, whether self-induced or other-induced. Ask Him to shed light on the significant relationships and forces that have contributed to your own boundary struggles. The past is your ally in repairing your present and ensuring a better future. Boundary development Remember the old saying, insanity is genetic. You inherit it from your kids? Well, boundaries aren't inherited. They are built. To be the truth-telling, responsible, free, and loving. People God wants us to be we need to learn limits from childhood on. Boundary development is an ongoing process, yet it's most crucial stages are in our very early years, where our char actor is formed. The scriptures advise parents to train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not turn from it, Prov. 22-6. Many parents misunderstand this passage. They think, 